Amen. Miss Shasser, would you lead us in opening prayer? Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. <laughs> we realize that we are a few in numbers, but we are trying to do like your will. Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless the, the sick and the shut in. I ask you to bless the pastor and his wife. Bless my family, oh God. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Amen. And, and welcome back to another week of Sunday School. Our lesson this week is salvation for all who believe. Salvation for all who believe. Now, salvation is a big word. What does it mean to you, Marilyn? <laughs> oh, salvation is free. Uh, let's see. What is salvation? Uh, to, the opportunity to receive uh, the word that uh, Jesus said that we shall be with him in heaven. We are we are his children. And so I shall go to heaven when that time comes. <laughs> okay, That's Rosalind. Rosalind, what salvation mean to you? A rebirth, a re renewal of your sins, a, a freedom in a sense from your sins. Freedom from sin. So who termed yeah. this word salvation? Where did it come from? Jesus. That's right. Yeah, Jesus. God the Father mm -hmm. sent Jesus the Son to save us from our sins. The word salvation means uh, deliverance. It means uh, prosperity. I don't know. <laughs> wow, all of a sudden now I got... <clears throat> and it means that we are saved from something in this case, sin. So the word salvation is a God word. It is how we talk about God and what God did through Jesus Christ. You cannot expect people in the world to know what salvation is. So if you walk up and ask somebody, have you been saved? Do you think they understand what you're saying? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Depends on whether they've been raised in church or raised in a yeah. home of godly people, right? So there are people yeah. in the world who've never heard the term salvation. We have a lot of church jargon that people in the world don't understand. When you ask them, are they saved? They looking at you like saved from what? Oh. I'm doing just fine. Yeah. So this shows in that there is a need, which we're gonna look at in this lesson, for someone to explain to them what salvation is, what salvation is about, how Jesus plays into this uh, notion of salvation and why God uh, needed to save us in the first place. So we know the four spiritual laws who have raised in the church, but we got to be able to teach these four spiritual laws to men and women who are not raised in the church, don't understand church lingo. We've got to change our conversation to be on their level. Otherwise, we'll misunderstand when people turn their faces uh, away from us and try to get away from us when we're behind them saying, you got to be born again, you got to be saved. They think you in Mars somewhere. They think something wrong with you. So mm -hmm. when we talk about salvation, know that this is church talk, not how we talk to people in the world. All right, we got to start out basic. And the first spiritual law is that we are a sinner. So we got to tell them what that is, <laughs> you know? And the second spiritual law is that we have to repent. The third spiritual law is that we have to receive Jesus Christ, uh, uh, salvation. And then the fourth spiritual law is that we've got to witness to others. So really what we're talking about here is a language that is foreign to people. You know, everyday people do not understand what you're talking about. And you're going to have to persuade them, reason with them, and uh, talk to them just like they are foreign to what you're saying, okay? Don't assume because they came to church on Sunday morning, they know what you're talking about when you say salvation, okay? Uh, give me one minute here. Now, our text tonight, printed text, is in Romans chapter 10, verse 5. Romans chapter 10, verse 5 through 
17. Before we get to that, we're going to talk about what our aims are. But the four spiritual laws are a way of sharing the good news of salvation that is available through faith in Jesus Christ. So you should know what the spiritual laws are and how you should uh, be able to explain those four spiritual laws. So I want to make sure that I cover the four spiritual laws in greater detail tonight because a lot of people do not know what those four spiritual laws are, okay? So we're going to talk about that. Uh, let me see here. Now, let us uh, begin then with our aim for change. Uh, Marilyn, would you read the aim for change? Okay, uh, aim for change. By the end of this lesson, we will explain Paul's confidence in the salvation offered in Christ, feel justified through our faith in Christ, and embrace with joy the possibility for all. Okay, so that's uh, those three tenets are our aim for change. We've got to explain why Paul is so confident about salvation by grace through faith. Why did Paul put his whole life on the line to preach this gospel? Because those of us who are saved understand that Paul really suffered a lot to get this message out, all right? So we're going to really take a look at that now. A little background, first of all, uh, this, this gospel that we're talking about is a word of faith, your Sunday school lesson says in your book, a word of faith, word of faith. So we're going to talk about that. Then we we might talk about Israel, we may not, because that's a complicated subject for a Sunday school lesson. I don't know how deep we can get into that, but it's about how is it that Israel rejected Jesus, yet they're going to be saved without accepting Jesus Christ in their lives. But then when judgment comes, God's got a way for Israel to be saved as well, as if God is playing by two different rules, and God is not. But God is sovereign. God's decisions are arbitrary. He make them any way he wants to because he's God. We can't control who gets in and out of salvation, in and out of heaven. That word is God's word only. Only God can do that, okay? So then, let's talk a little bit about Paul. What do you know about Paul, Rosalind? <laughs> that Paul was, uh, he changed me, Paul. He was Saul on the Damascus Road. Uh -huh. That may have, in, I won't say may have, that did, we have to say that did increase his faith and his strength in his faith. The people always want to know the background about people. That was one thing that did it. That actually, because look, he was a, persecuting or for if you want to say prosecuting and some people would say uh -huh. all Christians. But after that, uh uh, he was on the Christian side. He knew he was trying to speak it. He was trying to walk the walk and talk the talk. Okay. That was a big thing that happened. Did people accept his gospel? No, absolutely not. No. Not at first. I, you, you know no, what I'm thinking so why would they say so what? Why, they thought it was only for the uh, Jewish people. So why in the world would you uh, speak it to the Gentiles and expect them to, wait a minute, don't be just stop telling our stuff to the, to the Gentiles. No, no, don't do that. And they, they were used to him being one way, and then he changed and was a completely different way. So his past, so no, kept, they didn't, yeah. his past kept people from listening to him. Yeah. All right, Marilyn, you had something? Oh, um, I was about to say that 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 direct experience, he had a direct contact to the father. You know, the father spoke to him when well, Jesus spoke to him, just like, just like, yes, just like you you and I are speaking to each other. Except that he didn't see anybody; he just saw a light. So he had direct contact, and then all of a sudden, he was uh, told all these things that would happen to him and everything happened. So he was, uh, he had a direct experience. He had one of those experiences that was just life changing. 
So he was in agreement when they stoned Stephen. And we read about that in Acts, I believe it's chapter seven. He was in agreement. They threw Stephen's clothes at his feet at the end of stoning Stephen. And he got a bad reputation. <laughs> then he got an assignment from the high priest to go and track down people of the way, which were believers in Jesus. And so when they saw Paul coming, they saw a representative of the Pharisees because Paul was a Pharisee. He had lived as a Pharisee all his life. And then after that Damascus Road experience and after Ananias yeah. laid hands on him, he became totally convinced that he was wrong. He accepted the mission that Jesus gave him, but Jesus even said he was going to suffer a lot because of the response he would get from the people. So sometimes the response we get from people is not what we expect, but it's, it's in the mission that God gives us, and we have to be willing to suffer with Christ if we're going to reign with Christ. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to talk about this salvation. Salvation, again, means deliverance, and it means prosperity, and it means wholeness, it means well-being, and in this context, it's talking about in our relationship to God, not life in general, <clears throat> our relationship to God. So then the first thing your Sunday school book says, we cannot be saved <laughs> by the law. Somebody read verse five. Uh, y'all got a different book than mine. What page are y'all on? Okay. We're on 43. All right. Romans 10, verse 5. Somebody read that. For Moses For Mo describeth the righteous, which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Okay, that's enough. So we cannot be saved by the Ten Commandments that Moses wrote. They took those Ten Commandments and... <coughs> I'm going to need a bottle of water and made over 600 commandments for people to do not do this. They were so cumbersome that no one could, <coughs> could carry them out. That cough thing got in my throat. So Paul is saying we can, <coughs> we cannot be saved by the law <coughs> because nobody can keep the law. So if you can't keep the law, then you cannot, <clears throat> I don't know, be saved, all right? What do you think about that, Rosalind? Why did Moses give the law <laughs> if it could not save anybody? Well, so he, you know, he gave it just so we could go by, but he didn't say that it was going to save anybody. He to, to prove that we were imperfect, <laughs> the law was perfect. It, you know, that okay. is to prove that we were perfect and that we had to come to uh, in all of that. The only person who was perfect was Jesus Christ. So to come to him and to say, look, you know, we know we, we're in, in, uh, perfect. We read all these laws. We know we break all the time. So we have to come to you. You have to be our interventionist, so to speak. So the law did not make them right with God. The law. No was used by God to train them, to educate them in what it was to be right. Because they were coming out of slavery in Egypt. They didn't know what it was to be a country, to be a nation, to be a people group. So they had to learn. So God gave Moses discipline, gave him rules, gave him the law, law of how to treat God, and then laws of how to treat one another but it was never intended to save them. It was intended to show them how sinful they were and how weak they were in their righteousness toward God. And it certainly taught everybody that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it was a training tool, so yes. to speak, a training tool. That's right. Okay. All is our okay. teacher. Galatians even says that the law is our teacher, our taskmaster. But you have to be trained. We train up a child in the way that we should go, right? Same yeah. thing, mm -hmm. the children of Israel were children. Moses had to train them how they should live in order to please God. 
but no one could measure up to all 10 of, of those commandments. There were too much temptation, wickedness, and everything else. Yeah, and, so and, and also, and also uh, those each one of those commandments, it seems like it was something that had been uh, um, that the, the people of Israel were doing. You know what I'm talking about? They had been uh, uh, they had been uh, caught guilty of doing each one of those things. So God had to point it out to them. This is what you're doing, but this is what you should not be doing. Thou shalt not, you know, like, you know, like um, uh, kill. So therefore, I'm thinking all of those sins were being committed. And God had to bring it to their attention <clears throat> in the laws that this is something you can't, you can't do this. Right. And it's not thou shalt not kill, it's thou shalt not murder, which um, is a totally different thing. There are times when you have to kill, especially in self-defense, in war, which God, of course, uh, allowed uh, for the children of Israel. They had to fight to take over the promised land. So okay. it was thou shalt not murder. You don't go out and, and kill innocent people, be reckless and all of that, but you follow the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder, which is killing an innocent person. Okay, let's keep going. We are saved through Jesus Christ. Now, this is another way to be saved. You can't be saved by keeping the law because you can't keep all them laws. So there has to be another way for God to deem humanity righteous or in right relationship with God. And so Paul says there is another way. Read verse six and seven, Marilyn. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Seven, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Okay. So he is introducing a way that's called the way of faith. Righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ equals salvation. Righteousness by faith, well, I should say salvation equals righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. It's not about who's going to heaven or who's going to hell. We don't have any business trying to figure that out. God said all that's going to be done when judgment day comes. He's going to separate the righteous from the unrighteous, the wheat from the tares. We are not in the business of saying who's going to heaven and who's not based on the law, which is the Old Testament. There's only one commandment in the New, in the New Testament. Well, two, first is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and body. And the other one is love your neighbor as yourself. Those are only two commandments we have as believers in Jesus Christ that we have to do. Now you can't keep those two commandments without adhering to the moral law that Moses gave because the first five commandments in the book of Exodus deal with how you treat God. The second uh, commandments deal with how you treat each other. So it's still the law, but it's law with grace sprinkled all over it, all through it, mm -hmm. all between it. Is sprinkled in the blood of Jesus, which means you have forgiveness when you fall short, <clears throat> okay? And that you have been forgiven through the blood that Jesus that I shed on the cross. So it's not a complicated thing. Sometimes it's too simple, but it is a way of faith, all right? Let's talk about this. We must become Christians, but how? Now, the Sunday school author says we must become Christians. I say we must become believers in Jesus Christ. That's a different thing. Christianity is an institution. A believer is a way of life. Okay. okay. So uh, verse 8 uh, through verse uh, 9 there, uh, Rosalind, if you don't mind. Sure. But what, what saith it? The word is is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart 
that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Keep going through verse 11. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Okay, so here we go. This is the way you are born again. This is the way you are saved. It says that the gospel of salvation must be proclaimed or preached. Preaching is a proclamation. It's not a teaching. It is a proclamation. You are proclaiming what Jesus did on Calvary. You are proclaiming how God accepted what Jesus did on Calvary. And you are proclaiming what Jesus does as he is has risen from the dead and is seated at the right hand of God. That's the complete gospel. Crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. That's our affirmation of faith. That's the complete gospel. It's not just that he died, but he had to get up. It's not just that he got up, but when he got up, he went and sat at the right hand of God. Now he makes intercession for us. He's our great high priest. So the gospel message has to be preached completely. When you are sharing the gospel, you have to share it just like the affirmation of faith reads, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. I believe in the Holy Spirit. You've got to go through each and every phase as you are proclaiming and teaching about salvation. So it is a message then that as it is preached, faith comes. As it is preached, people develop faith to believe. And once they develop this faith to believe, then they have to make a confession with their mouth. You got that? Yeah. yeah. They have to confess what he says in verse 9, that Jesus is Lord. They have to believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead. And we're not talking about a spirit. We're talking about in the flesh that he had the same body that they hung on the cross with the same scars in that body when he rose from the dead, they got to believe the whole story. And if they hear the gospel message enough, guess what? Faith drops in their heart. Faith takes over. It's not a mental thing. It's a heart thing. It's a spiritual thing because the heart is the seat of the soul, your spiritual body, your true self is your spirit. And the spirit hears God's word. God's word speaks to your spirit. And all of a sudden now, instead of doubting, you catch faith. Faith, as verse 14 is going to say, comes by hearing. It does not come to any other way. They must hear it. I don't care if they read it on an app. Uh, they're hearing it on a, in a sermon. If they're talking to you, whatever, however, but they got to hear it. Now, it's just not a physical hearing. But hearing means to perceive, to understand, to see. When you understand something, you can see it. You always ask somebody, you see what I'm saying? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you see what I'm saying? Well, I want to know that you understand, you perceive. Your perception is acute. When you understand something, you see something. And when you see it, that means you understand it. It's all working together now because once you see it in the spirit, your mind can catch hold of it and, and explain it and rationalize it and you can believe it as a one being, body, soul, and spirit. Then you're born again. And so then once they make a confession, which is why we have people come down to the altar, we do our rite of confirmation, <coughs> our ritual of confirmation and acceptance, where they have to renounce Satan, accept Jesus, right? Believe in God, all that in our ritual in the back of our hymn. They go through that confirmation when they are 12 years old in our church, and they go through that confirmation when they're adults as going in a church. Okay? So that, that's what we have to know. We have to know that people have to hear. That's why churches are open. That's why churches are paying preachers. That's why people are 
paying evangelists. That's why people are going to tent meetings and rallies because they want somebody to preach. Preaching has its place. You must preach for people to gain faith. They will understand better if you teach. That's why normally a preacher is a preacher teacher, but they must first hear the word and catch faith by the proclamation before you start going all deep in your teaching, you know, and all that sort of thing. Proclamation, proclaiming the gospel story. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell the story. They don't teach the story. They tell the story about Jesus. So for Bible study, Sunday school, we can teach. Small group meetings, we can teach. But on uh -huh. Sunday morning, we are proclaiming the gospel. All right. And then if we have a church of mature saints, you can teach a little on Sunday morning too. You can do a little both. All right. So then now verse 12, Marilyn. And 13. Uh, 12 and 13. Uh, 12. Okay. On your, on the screen, Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All right. So Jews were getting saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Gentiles were getting saved by faith in Jesus Christ. But the Jews kept doing their festivals and their rituals and all the stuff they had been doing, whereas Gentiles were not subject to that because they were saved Feel with the Holy Spirit just by hearing the gospel. They didn't have to go get circumcised in order to be a part of God's family. God accepted them by their faith in Jesus Christ. And that was the big divide. The yeah. Jews did not want to accept the Gentiles unless the Gentiles got circumcised. Because they felt the pain. They wanted everybody else to feel the pain. You hear people say they got to get it the same way I got it. By golly, I had to go through. Are they going to go through? They're not just going to come in here and get this stuff for free. I had to go through it. That's And, and fraternities and sororities are great at saying, by, by the same way I got it, you're going to get it. As all brethren and fellows have done who've gone this way before me, just like I got it, you're going to get it. God had to beat me for me to get it. God got to beat you for you to get it. But that's not true. You don't have to go through what everybody else goes through. You have to have faith. That's the only requirement is faith. You don't have to be a certain length of time to be in church, to be saved. You don't have to have a certain length of time in order to be anointed. You don't have to have a certain length of time in order for God to use you. Only if you let people tell you that, they're putting you in bondage to what they went through but everybody doesn't have the same experience. So don't ever let anybody tell you what you got to do. You just have faith and God can take you just as far as your faith can lift you. But if you let people shortchange your faith, then everybody's going to tell you, well, I didn't, it didn't happen to me like that. So, uh, you know, it ain't going to happen to you like that. I had to sit on the front pew for a year before I sang in the choir. Before I became a usher, I went through 15 training sessions. Everybody wants everybody to go through just like they went through, but that's not the Bible. When you read Bible, especially in the book of Acts, you'll see God healing people, saving people, uh, filling people with the Holy Spirit, sending people out on mission. When Paul got saved, he didn't have to wait. You understand? He went off to himself. He and God developed this ministry of grace and faith, and he came back. He didn't go through the schools that the Jews, Jesus' brothers and them, the moderators of the early church, Paul didn't have to submit the Gentiles to that. And you read that in Acts 15. They had a great big court about whether or not Gentiles had to be circumcised and Gentiles had to keep the same festivals and all that. They concluded that the only thing them Gentiles had to do is give to the poor. That's it. But folk will set up a discipline. We got church <laughs> etiquette, church rules, and everybody got to come through this way 
and we block a whole lot of people from the church because we want them to get it like we got it. Come on, somebody, y'all quieter. I'm preaching better than y'all talking. <laughs> God, God, when God wants to use somebody, God has a right to use them. And we cannot tell them, no, you got to wait and go through what I went through. It took me 10 years. It's going to take you 10 years. That's not the Bible. That's Old Testament. But we're New Testament believers. Jesus called the disciples on one day, said, come follow me. And they walked with Jesus. And, and Jesus put them to work as soon as they started to walk. With them. Sent them out on missions. Let them test what they got. But we want people to sit in front of us for years before we want to commission them and send them out. So I'm saying to you that it's according to your faith, be it unto you. That's what Jesus said to the widow woman. That's what Jesus said to the woman with the issue of blood. That's what Jesus said to the man whose uh, daughter was dying. Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. Where is your faith? And if your faith is rooted and grounded in Jesus, there's no time limit or no time restriction to when you can be blessed and used by God. I'm, that, that ain't in the lesson. That's free, y'all. All right, next thing <laughs> says, we must take the good news to others. This is our call as preachers and lay preachers, not just me who was ordained, but lay preachers, people all over. We're all ministers on behalf of the God. We're all reconcilers trying to get people reconciled to God by preaching this gospel message, right? Verse 14 uh, and 15, uh, uh, who we got, Rosalind? Okay, surely. All right, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Am I reading? Yes, okay, yes. in whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Okay, hold And how on. shall they preach? Oh, uh, who is this him they talking about when he says call on him, believe in him? Oh, him is a hear about yeah. him. Who is he talking Jesus about? Christ. Right, Jesus. That's yeah. who brought that's the subject of salvation. Jesus, Yeshua means God is salvation. So when we say Jesus, we're saying God, salvation is named Jesus. You got to know Jesus in order to be saved, in order to be born again. Okay, going on with verse 15. Okay, here we go. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the good of peace, the gospel of peace, okay. and bring glad tidings of good things. Okay, so our feet are beautiful when we are sent by God to preach about Jesus. God sends his believers in Jesus to go and witness the good news to everybody who will listen. And whenever they see us, we've got the good news of salvation on our mind. We don't have the latest gossip. We don't have the latest news. Our perspective is always skewed. It's always skewed toward God. And God's worldview, not the worldview of the Democrats or the Republicans. We are always wondering what God has to say, right? And because we're wondering what God has to say and how God is to uh, how God is to be perceived, we tell the story the way God told the story. We don't change it. We don't change it. We tell the story the way God told the story in the Bible. And when we are telling the story and being sent by God, this word sent means that when you're sent out, God is with you. God is going to take care of you. God is going to make sure you have every opportunity to preach the good news. But verse 16 says, not everyone welcomes the good news. So everybody you talk to is not going to receive it. Are you supposed to argue with them? No. No. Are you supposed to fuss at them? No. Are you no. supposed to condemn them to hell? No. 
No, Just you can't do that. Away. Shake the dust and keep moving, going to the next person. Because Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our message? Because only God knows you may not be the witness that they need to hear. So you can't upset them so that they won't be able to hear the next person that's going to come in their life. Because God's going to keep sending the message to them. So when they stand before God, they're not going to be able to say, I never heard this before. Oh, you heard it. <laughs> God going to have a record where you heard it. You just what? Rejected it. And then verse 17. So faith comes from hearing. That is hearing the good news about Christ. That is the only yeah. subject of salvation. It is Christocentric, which means centered on Christ. Christ is the main attraction. Miss uh, Miss Miss Young, you're gonna unmute yourself. Christ is the main attraction. In every church, Christ is the main attraction. In every believer's life, Christ is the main attraction. Christ is who we brag about. Christ is who we talk about. Christ is who is our salvation. Christ is our strength. Christ is our leader. Christ is our redeemer. Christ is our kinsman redeemer. Christ is God's glory. Christ is God's son. Christ is out the atoning sacrifice for our sins. All we talk about is Jesus to every person who has not heard about salvation. So now yes. your brothers and sisters in Christ, you don't have to spend all your time talking about Jesus because you're studying the word, building each other up. You're talking about the world and how you're praying on behalf and interceding on behalf of what's happening in the world. You have a different conversation with believers than you do with unbelievers. But every now and then you have to preach the gospel to yourself because when you sin and the devil tried to make you feel guilty, you got to remember you were saved by faith too, not by good works. You were saved by faith, not by how right you kept the law. You were saved by faith, not by if you crossing every I, I mean, dotting every I and crossing every T, right? You are, yeah. you are saved through your faith in Jesus Christ. So when the devil accuses you of doing something wrong, you plead the blood. You plead just let the blood. devil know, I plead the blood of Jesus. Jesus is my armor bearer. Jesus is my great high priest. I don't have to answer to you, devil. I answer to Jesus. And I'm covered in the blood of Jesus. And then you get back mm -hmm. on your righteousness kick, which is the one thing we said we were going to do, right? Explain why Paul had such confidence. Paul kept preaching this gospel even when he was stoned, when he was let down in a basket out of, uh, over the gates of the city, when he was stoned and left for dead, when he was shipwrecked, when he was in prison. Paul, when he was beaten, oh, he just kept telling this story about Jesus. That takes confidence in what you're saying. If the devil can cause you to stop talking, that means you've lost confidence in your belief about Jesus. So when you're around a bunch of people that intimidate you, do you ever think that that's the devil trying to silence you? Well, his family, friends, or whoever, you want to say something about Jesus, but you are scared of what folk going to say. That's intimidation. They close your mouth. Once they close your mouth, they steal your power. So you got to have confidence in this gospel in order to share this gospel, in order to witness to this gospel. So we're talking about the four spiritual laws. And we said that the first thing is that you have to admit that you're a sinner, acknowledge that you're a sinner. And once you acknowledge that you're a sinner, then you have to also acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the way to salvation. Therefore, you repent of your sins. That's the third thing. And then you accept the salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. Then you are a believer. Then the Holy Spirit washes you. Then the Holy Spirit cleanses you. Then you are born again and you live now by your faith in Jesus Christ based on the word of God, washed by the Holy Spirit, and you live your life in a different manner. Because everything you do in life, you're going to check with God in prayer to see if that's something God wants you to do. That takes spending time with God, having your morning devotionals, your prayer times in the morning, noon, and night, 
reading your Bible morning, noon, and night, memorizing scripture verses, having spiritual disciplines where you know you have affirmations based on the word of God. Your whole life now is centered around establishing your relationship with God such that God can then use you to win souls to Jesus Christ. Salvation is for everybody. Salvation is for everybody. Any comments before we go to the next slide? Your application. I was reflecting on the fact when I said salvation is free during my opening statement. And I was thinking, I said, well, uh, you know, some people who are not in the church and have not, uh, you know, been, have not been aware of that um, that that comment would probably say, uh, "What what 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 do you mean by salvation is free?" They wouldn't know what I was talking about. Yeah, and the thing about salvation is, uh, it's not free. <laughs> it cost Jesus <laughs> everything he had. It cost God mm. everything it had. And people say, "Well, it cost God through Jesus, but it doesn't cost you." Yeah, it still costs you because what are you sacrificing? The old way. Your old life, you surrendering your whole former life by your faith in Jesus Christ and becoming a disciple. A disciple is someone who takes somebody else's life and imitates it, leave their life, leave their goals, their ambitions, what they want to be in the world and how much money they want to have, what bigger house they want to have, what kind of car they want to drive. They get rid of all that and turn to God through faith in Jesus Christ. And if God says drive a high Hyundai, that's what they drive. If God says <laughs> live in a shotgun house, that's where they live. If God says go on a missionary journey in Africa or, or go in Chicago in the hood where you could be shot in an instant and God send you there to witness as a missionary in the urban areas, that means you go. Now you, for, you forfeit your life and accept Christ's life and Christ will for your life. You've given up a lot. You just don't know it. Yes, you're getting faith, but that faith is really tested when you are following Jesus. When you're going where Jesus says go, everybody is not going to have a mansion in this life. Everybody's not even going to have a new car in this life. I know God promises to bless us, but the blessings of God maketh rich and addeth no sorrow that word rich means prosperous and you're prosperous in doing the will of god even if you don't have a mansion when you're doing the will of god you are prosperous when you're doing the will of god you're in well-being those people in the early church didn't have anything but each other in jesus mm -hmm. and they weren't looking for nothing in this life they were looking for it in the life to come but it's not fashionable to talk about heaven anymore because people say, I can have a little heaven on earth. And yeah. you can if God allows, right? But Paul said, I've learned to be content in whatsoever state I find myself. <laughs> so are you content in whatever state you find yourself as you are pursuing the will of God for your life? Where is your ambition in gaining this world or is your ambition in pleasing God? Which one? Because you can lose a 401k overnight. You can lose a home to a fire in less than a day. You can you can lose, you know, your family can, I've had a son die. I mean, you know, the life has its ups and downs. But where is your ambition? Is your ambition to please God or to be a... Uh, a capitalist, a member of society, get all you can, you know, and, and save it up and stock it up and all that other kind of thing. And yet you're stingy toward God. You don't tithe, you don't give offerings, you know, you hold on to everything you got with a tight fist <laughs> or do you release it to God and say, God, whatever you need, here it is. I know you're going to give me more because your Bible says you're going to give me more and I trust you. See, when you get saved, you are sacrificing just like Jesus sacrificed his life. You're supposed to sacrifice your life and live it to the glory of God. Is that too deep a concept? Y'all looking at me like a deer with headlights. 
<laughs> is that too deep a concept? No. I mean, people really judge their salvation based on whether or not they got a new house, a new car. All their kids went to college. And everybody got a PhD or DDD and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Everything in their life is going honky-dory. They feel like they are blessed and highly favored. But if they're sitting in jail because they stood up for somebody who couldn't stand up for themselves, they don't think they're blessed. But if the Holy Spirit led them to stand up for that person and they ended up in jail for a voice in their opinion, advocating for that person, then they are, in fact, in the will of God and the church is supposed to rally around them, right, and support them mm -hmm. in that. So where you will end up in life is based on where the will of God leads you. Because you can have all that stuff in the world and be empty, not have any peace, not have any joy, because yes, you pulled yourself up by your bootstrap. Yes, you went to college. Yes, you saved your money in your 401k or your annuity or your savings, stock markets. You got all that. You got it going on, you balling. But who are you telling about Jesus while you balling? Mm -hmm. Wherever you go, if somebody's in need, Jesus ought to come out of your mouth. I don't care where you are. You can be at the beach, at the, at the disco, at the casino, at the juke joint, wherever you are, you are a representative of God and you ought not be ashamed to tell people you know Jesus because not based on how you living, it's based on your faith that you are saved. For you are saved through grace and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, lest any should boast. There's no good thing in us except the Holy Spirit and except the salvation that God has given us. So I don't have to keep up with the Joneses. I don't have to impress nobody. I can live my life like it's golden, but I'm always on call. When I was in the army, we had a thing called guard duty, guard duty, right? 24 hours. And you were sergeant of the guard. You would go up at headquarters and sit there and, you know, put your feet up all night long. You was what? Always on call. <laughs> Same thing as a believer in Jesus. You are always on call. And people who are coming into all these places where you go, they need somebody to tell them about Jesus when they come in there because the Bible says, as you go, make disciples. So it doesn't matter. You a reverend and you here, you 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 saved and you in the, you dancing, you you listen, it ain't about you, it is about Jesus. And if I see somebody in need of Jesus, I'll grab their hand and pray with them. I don't care where I'm at. And everybody can stand around and listen. I don't care about that. I'm not going to get off my job because I'm somewhere people say I'm not supposed to be. Jesus ate with sinners and, he, and, he, and, and, and parted and had a good time. But whenever he needed to give a word, what did he do? He shared a word. He healed the sick. Wherever he was, it didn't matter. You know, and we have to be in that same vein. We have to know that our salvation is not about us. We are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. So the devil cannot accuse us before God. God doesn't even entertain the devil. And sometimes the devil wears skin in the form of human beings. But we, we have to pray for them and keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Because we ought to know, we ought to have confidence that we're saved we don't have confidence that we can live holy. We don't have confidence that we can be perfect, but we show all to have confidence that we are saved and on our way to heaven because we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now, this application says there are people all around you who need to hear the good news of salvation on your job, in the stores, uh, in the hospitals, in the cafeterias, in the malls, wherever you are, somebody there needs to hear about Jesus. So it says that we should determine in our heart and carry out the plan of witnessing to someone in your family, on your job, or in your community. Just make a decision. You're going to tell folk about Jesus. It says pray first, though, and ask God to show you someone who needs a Savior and then help you to find the right time place and words to obey his command. What did I tell y'all about the five second rule? If the Holy Spirit gives you an idea, you got five seconds to act on it. 
If you don't walk up to that person in five seconds, they're going to pass you by. You got to do something tangible, something concrete. You either got to walk up and introduce yourself. You got to walk up and ask me, is there anything I can do for you? You look perplexed today. You look, you look like you could just use a word of encouragement. And you do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do in that moment. But after five seconds, guess what? That's your opportunity to go. Now, you don't stand there and lament the fact that you didn't act. It's another opportunity to come in. <laughs> All day long, there are going to be opportunities. Which opportunities you accept is on you and the Holy Spirit. So if you're the type of person that's always talking about God, always talking about Jesus, somebody hear you and they're listening to you. And I'm not talking about the person you're standing in front of. I'm talking about that crowd that can be around listening and you don't think nobody listens. So I always know you're talking to more than one person, praying for more than one person. I always know that the Holy Spirit is reaching other people as you have the name of Jesus in your mouth. Don't be afraid to witness about Jesus. All right. Any comments before we end this? Mm. Uh, ask, yes, that does include that does include also, um, I think it includes if you just want to listen, sometimes people just need someone to listen to them. Not necessarily. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. You don't, you know, if you don't speak it, the word, if you don't talk about the word, but sometimes it comes in the form of you just listening. And that's what they needed all that time. They just needed someone to listen to them. I've had that happen to me. And at the end of the conversation, I don't, I will not say anything. That's believe it or not. I have not said anything. And that person goes, you know, I feel a, so much better. I needed to get that out. I needed to tell that somebody, that's it. That's all I had to do was just be that ear on the other side of the line listening. And every now and then, uh-huh, uh-huh. That's, that's, I, just, that's, I didn't that's, have to say anything. That's dangerous if they're not believers, though, because you're only giving them half of the good news. Mm -hmm. Because even though mm -hmm. they got it out, what context are they in when they leave? If they're believers, then, of course, you're listening as a, as a believer, brother or sister. But if they're unbelievers and they needed to vent about something, there is that opportunity for you to put a scripture, uh, 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 an affirmation about the goodness of God in there. Because you want them saved. You don't want them just to vent. You want them to receive the power from God to be able to deal, deal with it when you're not around. Deal with it when nobody else is around. So you introduce them to, mm -hmm. to, to your savior. You talk about, well, you know, I, you, I had to vent one time and that was before I got saved. Once I got saved, I started talking to Jesus and I feel so much better when I let this stuff go into, into his hands and I cast all my cares upon him. I get such a peace. And then they have a response back to you. How did you do that? That's a, see, then now you're taking them full circle all the way around, giving them an opportunity now to either accept Jesus or at least to hear about Jesus called faith come by hearing. Hearing by the word of God doesn't mean you're going to quote a scripture, but it means what you're saying is based on the scripture. You know what I mean? You're having a common yeah. conversation, but you're not using Bible jargon that they don't understand. You're putting it in terms that they can understand. So the first thing is always in evangelism is to accept people where they are. But after you accept them where they are and acknowledge them as a human being, then you want to seek to influence them for Jesus. And if you can influence them for Jesus, then you have an opportunity to win a soul to Christ. So you got to go all the way full circle. Don't just let them vent. If they don't know God, tell them about how you had a bad situation and your faith in Jesus helped you through it. And you just let them know now in case I'm not here or you don't have anybody else, you always have God. You can always pray. God still hears a sinner's prayer. In other words, you're not you're not throwing the Bible at them. You're talking about your life and your right. experiences. You're sharing your experience with them. And so if each one of us tell our story to people that we meet of how the Lord delivered us, then that gives us entryway into the spread in the gospel, which is powerful. And more people would get saved and more people would begin to pray because they have a witness now 
that the Bible, the God has just not did something in the Bible, but he's actually doing it now, today, in real life. You see what I'm saying? Don't keep God in the yeah. Bible. Bring God in the 21st century. You know what he's done for you. Tell somebody. Don't just tell what he did for Moses and Isaac and Jacob and David. No, it's some Davids in the 21st century. It's some Rebecca's in the 21st century. It's some Hannah's in the 21st century who cried out to God for a child and God gave them a miraculous birth. We listen, we got to we got to share our stories because we have stories to tell. We just haven't been taught how to do it. And that's where Bible study and Sunday school comes into play. We learn how to tell this story, how to direct people along that path of salvation and get them to accept Jesus. They don't have to come to church behind you, but if they accept Jesus, guess what? The angels in heaven rejoice, and that's a chalk on your on your mark, on your board. That, that's another niche in your crown because you led somebody to Jesus, invited them to church, but you led them to Jesus. They were saved when they came with you to church because you prayed with them. They didn't need to give the preacher their hand to get saved. They just need to come up and introduce them to the preacher and tell the preacher, I met this person that gave their life to Jesus and then the preacher take up from there. That's the way discipleship is done. I'm excited about this year we got coming up because there's so many opportunities for us to win lost souls to Jesus Christ. We just got to be open to the possibility, open to the Holy Spirit to give us boldness to just share our stories. Thank you guys for tonight. I think we've covered this lesson quite thoroughly. Uh, and I think we have learned something tonight, have we not? Yes, we have. Amen. Yes, yes we have. Uh, so I appreciate all of you. Uh, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for our time together tonight. We thank you for teaching us about salvation and what salvation means. We ask that we will be endued with power from on high to be bold in sharing our story, telling people how much you mean to us and what you've done in our lives. Thank you, oh God, for wherever we are, whenever you send somebody who needs a word in due season, you can use us to get the job done. Now God saves souls through this Sunday school lesson. In Jesus' name, in Jesus amen name. and amen. amen. God bless you. Amen. God keep you.